I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So good morning, and happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers and father figures out there. I hope you enjoy your day. Whether you're going to go play golf or maybe you're going to see if Mickelson can finish it up or looking forward to game five tonight, whatever it is you do for Father's Day, I hope you enjoy it. So what is it about this fatherhood that we get our own special day? <laughs> do you think about it much? I admit that I don't think about it much. I mean, I do it, but I don't really think about it, this notion of fatherhood. What ideas and pictures pop into your head? Maybe it's going fishing, going camping, going hiking, having a barbecue. Maybe it's like this picture. <laughs> Did you see this picture? <laughs> I know it's funny, but there's a lot of truth in it, too. This is sort of, a, well, Jen would say, you don't vacuum. So. <laughs> But there's some truth in the way fatherhood looks now. It's, it's not the way it was 100 years ago. So some of our notions might have changed about fatherhood, but I think there's some timeless truths about fatherhood too. For example, do you remember Bill Cosby back in the 80s doing a stand-up routine? This is one of the things that Cosby says. Fathers are the geniuses of the house because only a person as intelligent as we could fake such stupidity. Think about your father. He doesn't know where anything is. You ask him to do something, he messes it up, and your mother sends you. Go down and see what your father's doing before he blows up the house. <laughs> see, he's a genius at work because he doesn't want to do it, and he knows someone will be coming to stop him soon. <laughs> Fathers are geniuses. I like that. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that can relate to that. You see, I love being a father. I imagine that's why I always tell stories about my kids in my sermons. Being a father is a huge part of my identity. But I know I'm not a perfect father, just as I know that there are no perfect fathers. So here's my question. How is it that we call God our father, when the only reference we have to fathers are just regular guys like me, who are so flawed when it comes to being a father? How is it? I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. I think Jesus told us to pray to our Father because it establishes that we are in relationship with God. And likewise, we are in relationship with each other. So that's it for me, I think. We are intimately connected with God and with each other through this fatherhood. It is this God the Father who loves us and wants the best for us. It is this God the Father who sees us as we are and forgives us. And it is this God the Father who wants us to treat each other so well. That's the hardest one, I think. Treating us, treating each other well. Like real blood, brothers and sisters, that's not easy. <laughs> you see, I watch my own boys and I want them to love each other. They usually do. They're good boys. But there are times, man, oh, there are times when that love for each other it gets a little fuzzy, it gets a little twisted. We have one of these plastic baby pools in our backyard. I'm sure you're familiar with these things. You know, with summer, the kids just love being in that pool. And they have a blast. I mean, everybody's smiling and laughing. They're having fun. There's even a little slide in it so they can slide down. All three of them in there, splashing, squirting each other. The five-year-old, the three-year-old, the one-year-old. The sun is shining. The birds are chirping. And, well, everybody's happy, happy, happy. <laughs> and then it happens. <laughs> I don't know what causes it or how it gets started, but they have these plastic squirt toys. And, you know, at first they're shooting into the yard or the plants, and then they turn them on each other. <laughs> the splashing becomes more violent. <laughs> Their squirting somehow loses its innocence. And at one point, I have even seen one of my older boys lording over the one-year-old and just pummeling him in the chest with water, squirting him. 
The baby's crying and laughing at the same time, doesn't know what to do. And so I yell out, cut it out, cut it out. You know, I lose my temper usually. And he is so focused on just destroying his brother, (laughs) he doesn't even hear me talking to him. He has no clue. So I yell, everybody out, stop squirting, everybody out. Don't worry, Jen handles this stuff a lot better than I do. But I love all my boys very much, and to see them acting like that towards one another, well, it drives me crazy. So the language of God, the Father, it works for me. What I mean is, I get that our Father wants us to treat each other well. I know how it feels when your children are not nice to one another. It's not a good feeling. I think Luke's gospel today speaks to that, too. Think back on the gospel you just heard. Jesus has been invited into Simon the Pharisee's house. Now, this isn't Simon Peter. Don't get confused who this is. This is Simon a Pharisee, which means he was very concerned with observing the Torah, with purity laws. It was a big deal to him. And so Simon invites Jesus to this dinner, and here comes this woman. She comes in, and she starts crying. She's washing Jesus' feet with her tears, washes his feet dries his feet with her hair, kisses his feet, anoints his feet. Simon thinks this is terrible. This is terrible. But Jesus, I think, is showing us something about God here. He's showing Simon something, and he's showing us something. You see, I think we're given this story, and we're given two very different ways of of interacting with God and encountering Jesus. The first is Simon. Simon, who I think is just sort of curious about Jesus. Just sort of curious. Maybe he's seen him around town. Maybe he's heard about his miracles. Maybe he's seen him. So I picture him as being curious about this Jesus, inviting him in, maybe wanting to have an intellectual dispute of theological magnitude, you know, this wonderful debate. Yeah, just getting out of seminary not too long ago, there was a lot of that. (laughs) A lot of this heady stuff. And it's all good. It's fun. I, I actually, I love that stuff. I love talking about predestination, get me going. That's fun stuff for me. But it's all very heady, and it's a mental exercise. Nothing wrong with it, but that's not all there is to this Jesus. And if Simon was wanting that, what he got was something very different. What he got was what it looks like to fully engage God. What he got was what it looked like to realize that you're in the presence of God, a very real and visceral encounter with the holy. So what's he do? No thanks. He doesn't want to have any part of it, right? In fact, he's disgusted. This sinner touching Jesus. This sinner. You know, that's something we hear a lot around churches. Well, we're all sinners. You've probably heard it. I'm sure I've said it even. We're all sinners. But I think there's usually an unsaid component to that because what do we really think? Well, there's sinners and then there's sinners, right? We're all sinners with a little S. (laughs) But then there are other sinners with the big S. You see, Simon was calling this woman a sinner with a big S. A big S sinner. Do you get it? She's not like us. Nope. She's not one of us. You feel the judgment? You feel the resentment? The self-righteous attitude? Does it make you feel uncomfortable a little bit? I can't stand people like this. I can't stand these judging Simons. I admit it. I think dark things about people like that. I mean, you know who the good guy is and who the bad guy is here. Simon, who's the judge of his own little world, and the woman on the ground. Well, she's obviously the good guy, right? This is a softball story. Hold on. Wait a minute. You see, I realize now I'm doing the judging. I'm judging Simon. Just like he judged this woman, I'm doing the judging now. I think that's the beauty of this story. It invites you in. It sucks you in. You know where it's going, and then you realize, whoa, I'm doing the very same thing that I hate about Simon. Judging judging. What a cycle. How do we stop it? Well, it'd be easy for me to say we need to be like the woman on the ground. We need to be overflowing with love and devotion to God. It's easy to say, but I'm not sure 
I can do that so easily. Maybe there are a few times in your life when you are overwhelmed and you can be that woman. But that's not where I usually live my life. Maybe there's another way for the rest of us, a way that might speak to you. Get back in the story. Jesus tells his parable, the lone shark, and then what he does is the best part of the story for me. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I'll say it again because I think it's the best part. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Can you see it in your mind's eye? Jesus had been looking at Simon, telling him in the parable, explaining the woman's actions, and then he turns his head and looks at this woman, but still speaking to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her, really? You see something you disapprove of, something you believe to be impure, some kind of object of disgust. But do you see her the way that Jesus sees her? A beloved child of God? A forgiven sinner? A fellow human being who's just trying to survive? Do you see her through the eyes of this love? Does it send chills down your spine like it does mine? Jesus looking at this woman, really seeing her? You see, Simon might be interested in Jesus or curious about Jesus, but Simon will never really understand who Jesus is until he sees this woman in the same way that Jesus sees the woman. We will never really understand who Jesus is until we can see like that. So the question is, will Simon be able to see this woman differently? The story doesn't tell us. So I ask you, I ask myself, will I really be able to see those around me the way Jesus sees them? It's certainly not easy, I know that. But Jesus gives us a way out, see them the way he sees them. Broken, crying, forgiven, and loved. See them the way he sees them. Embrace the fact that our Father in heaven has made us all brothers and sisters. It's the way we can really come to truly encounter the living God. So the story I told of my kids in the baby pool isn't the most flattering one. So I want to leave you with the good side of seeing kids through the eyes of a father. My kids love puzzles. Bill and Tom love to put puzzles together. And when Bill, my oldest, is doing a puzzle, he's almost done, he always lets Tom, my middle son, put that last piece in. Or if Tom is playing with Bill and Bill's the oldest, so Bill always likes to be the lead character in whatever adventure they're imagining, Batman, Robin, whatever, Tom is always more than happy to be the supporting character. And even baby Jim now, if he's eating food that he likes, <laughs> he likes to always share it with Bill and Tom. He will try to literally stick the spoon into their mouths. <laughs> he wants them all to taste the goodness he's experiencing. See, when I see them behaving like that to one another, this dad smiles a real big smile. And I know God's smiling a real big smile too. So that's what I mean when I say I get it, this God the Father notion. So call your father today, or say a prayer for him if he's passed on. But this Father's Day, I also want you to remember that you are a child of God the Father. And just like the woman in the gospel, you are seen, and you are loved by God. So go, love each other, and see each other as the beautiful of children of God that you are. Go in love. Amen.